Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hancock. I'm with, uh, I'm on the board for the USA chapter of the International Humanistic Management Association. I also run a company called Humanist Learning Systems. And this is Teaching Teachers to Teach Values. Our guest today is Monsieur Lodi, one of my friends from India. I met him, uh, gosh, a few years ago now. He is the founder of the Entrepreneurship School in India. Um, and he mentors entrepreneurs and advises business owners and business leaders. And he is focused on entrepreneurship and courage. He's worked for a lot of companies, done consulting. He's uh, got a BCom and an MA in human resources, both from the University of Jamia Malia, Islama, India, and the MBA from Cranfield, UK, uh, University UK. And he's uh, currently doing a longitudinal study on organizational leadership's perception of COVID-19 in connection with researchers at the University of East London, UK. Um, welcome, Monsieur, it's good to have you. Thank you so much, Jen, uh, for inviting me and to the International Humanistic Management Association for considering me for a talk here. Thank you. Well, you know, you, you're you as interested in ethics and the teaching of ethics as I am, so I thought you would be a good resource for us. Um, so go ahead and get started so everybody knows if you have any questions as Monsieur is talking, go ahead and put them in the chat and um, we'll, we'll get to them when he's done. Go ahead, Monsieur. Okay, Jen, thank you so much. Uh, I'm now going to share my screen so that we proceed with our presentation. Uh, great. I hope, Jen, you can see my screen. Jen, if you could just yes. give me a hand. Yes, I do. It looks Wonderful. good. Thank you. Thank you, Jen, once again, and thank you, everyone, for logging in to this talk. Um, what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm going to throw some perspective from the practical world rather than just talking about the theory. And I think it is important, uh, from my perspective, it is important to basically understand how uh, in organizations in, and in the practical world, values are understood and then values are absorbed by people. So my focus would basically be around bringing my experience of about 17, 18 years when I have uh, tried to think about values and ethics and how do we embed them in organizational perspective. So with this, um, uh, here is the agenda uh, for today's talk. I'll just take you through uh, basic stuff which I I, I know um, most of you are aware of, but still I would like to touch upon that uh, in terms of the concept of values. Uh, then uh, we will explore some frameworks of business ethics that I learned from my professor of leadership and ethics at Cranfield University, Donna Letkin, and I have borrowed this from her book. And then uh, we are going to explore some of the real life examples where I uh, have been able to help organizations and people in those organizations align the values of groups of people to that of the organizations. So with this, uh, uh, in terms of the concept, I think uh, let's have a brief view of the context in which uh, the values operate. And I'm going to uh, touch upon uh, really basic stuff in terms of what value uh, means uh, in the context of humanity and in the context of organizations and how do they really help us. So as we all know, um, the values are basically our core beliefs um, and they are the ones which basically help us define our actions uh, in, the, in the world and they guide our uh, actions basically. So that's uh, broadly uh, what we understand about values. But there is something which I have really um, uh, learned over a period of time is that if values are defined well in the context of an organization, they play a very important role of being a guide to people when they are lost, when they do not know what to do. And there come the values of the organizations uh, that can help these people define and inform their decisions and actions. 
So values in that sense are a great tool to help us uh, chart our paths when the path is no more clear to us. So that's what I believe uh, is, the, is the brief uh, overview of uh, what values are, what do they mean, and how do they actually help us uh, in, in our day-to-day -day lives. In terms of formation, what I think, and uh, uh, this is based on my own experience over a period of time, what I think, the, there are two broad ways in which people uh, go on to uh, shape their value system over a period of time. And the first thing is uh, people's own active observation and reflection and introspection uh, around what is happening uh, around them. And which is where uh, the, the individual in question becomes extremely important while shaping the values. And this is one uh, element that I'm going to touch in some of the following slides when we are going to look at how do we build values in our students. So while, while all of us act, we always reflect on our actions. Maybe when we are sleeping, uh, when we are about to sleep in the night, or when we are finding some time uh, after some hectic schedule or hectic action, when we f find some time to think about what have we done, those are the moments which help us reflect on our actions, thinking, and how did we operate in a particular situation. And if we are doing those exercises in our mind, I think they are the, um, the, the elements that go on to shape our values uh, in the longer run. So that is one, but there is certainly other element which is on your screen is the environment. So environment will have uh, a number of elements which uh, which are going to uh, shape my values. So be it the culture. So if I'm in the US, I will go on to build a certain value system uh, as compared to when I'm in India. Uh, both the cultures are different and I would definitely have certain values which are going to be different from those in the United States. So the culture defines uh, my, my, my values. Uh, the other important element, uh, which is uh, really important for the audience here, because I realize that most of us are teachers and professors here, teaching uh, again plays a very critical role in shaping the values of our students. And, and sometimes this teaching goes beyond the normal and formal school system where you go on to find uh, your own mentor who takes on the role of a teacher and uh, helps us shape uh, over difficult uh, paths. And, and that is how we also build um, a sense of uh, values and, and sort of behaviors that we need to demonstrate in certain uh, situations. So, so the second bit that I'm talking about, culture, teaching, situation, and experiences are those um, to, to which we respond as individuals when we uh, get exposed to these, uh, these elements in the environment. And the way we respond to them go on to eventually define my values. So the first one is where I am uh, trying to understand what is happening around me and trying to, uh, trying to build a sense of my own values. But in the second, really, there are push factors which are defining my values. Uh, there is an important uh, framework that I learned from my professor Donna Letkin in, in Cranfield. And what Donna says, uh, there are three frameworks, basically, and this is what I borrowed from her book. Uh, three frameworks which are normally used by businesses in shaping their own value system or their own ethics uh, in the organization. Uh, the first one is deontological approaches, which basically means the entire approach of value creation in that organization is driven by the the, the ideology that what is right, what is right to do is our approach to define our values as an organization. So for example, um, if, if you look at uh, the example of is, is stealing the right thing to do or not? Is capital punishment is the right thing or not? Is abortion a right thing or not? So those are the examples of deontological approaches. And when we engage our students in conversations like these, 
is when they are exposed to the thinking of values. And this is how we basically uh, help our students appreciate different views on a particular topic such as capital punishment or abortion. Uh, many of us would disagree with uh, one idea or the other uh, and we will have our own arguments and equally strong arguments uh, against the opposing uh, ideology. But encouraging students to, to basically be able to understand both the sides and be able to comprehend what the arguments are and what are the reasons that both the sides are giving is something which is, uh, which is what we could do as teachers in shaping their values. So deontological approach uh, basically talks about what is right uh, for everyone, what is right for us needs to be driving our value system. The next is utilitarian approach. And, and, and when I was reading this, I was reminded of Socrates because uh, Socrates was one who said, it is okay for the government to lie to its citizens if it is, uh, if it is uh, fine for the larger good. If it serves the larger good, then it is okay to lie, right? That's the utilitarian approach. Uh, and which basically tells that look at what is good for the larger uh, society uh, or for the larger cause. If it is good for the larger cause, go ahead uh, with it. What it also means uh, for times like these that we are going through, uh, that organizations will have to lay off people and cut jobs. Now, it's a difficult time, right, for organizations and leaders might be finding uh, um, themselves into ethical dilemma that how should they approach it? Uh, jobs, uh, jobs being cut is never a good idea or right idea at any point in time. But how do we then um, work around these challenging times uh, is when we can find an answer to utilitarian approaches. And, and which is where the utilitarian approach becomes important. The next and the final uh, framework through which organizations inform their value system could be virtue ethics. And, and, and I remember one of the audience members has specifically talked about it in their question is, uh, see, um, virtue ethics basically talks about uh, imagining the character that you and I uh, have been exposed to and try and understand how would that character uh, apply uh, decisions and actions in a particular situation and trying to make sense of how can I basically guide my actions accordingly. So that is one way of doing it. I remember my time at, uh, at MBA in Cranfield when I was asked to write a paper on leadership. And uh, what I did, uh, instead of picking Martin, Ma Martin Luther King or Gandhi or some other figure, I picked up my mother as a leader. Uh, and it made my writing so easy and so connecting to me because I was able to see right from my childhood how my mother had operated in different situations and in difficult situations in the family and outside the family. That had me think about what leadership is. And that showed some very important, very important values in me, one of which was being honest. Now, honest might sound a bit cliche, but I tell you, if we are able to connect with someone who has demonstrated honesty in actions, not in words, but in actions. And if I know what those behaviors are, what those actions are, it becomes a lot more clear for me to operate uh, in a better manner when it comes to displaying honesty. So I think uh, those are the three approaches that I wanted to touch upon uh, before moving into the actual real life case studies that I have experienced in my life. Uh, and which is where I now want to bring the, uh, the practitioner's guide to you all and this is my own experience. And here is the first case study of a global pharma company where I worked uh, some years back. Um, and what we realized was post uh, the merger of two giants, uh, we, we finally had an, an even more larger organization, uh, a pharma company, where we were struggling with some very important aspect of merging the cultures of two organizations. When we were trying to do that, we realized that people from two different cultures had two different views of, on a number of things. For example, one organization was not very process oriented. The other organization was highly process oriented. The moment we tried to 
implement a number of processes on, on both the groups equally, of course. The one group which was used to processes was fine with it, but the other group keep, keep coming back to us, kept coming back to us with the questions that, why are you asking so many questions? Why there are so many processes and systems in place? Don't you trust us? Now, those were the questions um, and the statements we never expected, but those were the things that surprised us. And this is what I remember I did a uh, good 10 years back, 15 years back. So what we did was uh, we looked at the organizational values. There were six values. And we said these six values are awesome values, but they look good on the corporate wall. People don't understand it. We need to make people understand what these values are. And we can't just tell them the interpretation or translation of values. We went to them and we talked to them talk to them about the values, but we also talk to them about the associated behaviors, displaying those values in the context of this organization. So, so that's an important element uh, because value would carry a universal meaning, of course, but associated behaviors will be unique in unique contexts. And I will touch upon that later. And once we did that, we basically asked uh, people to come up with their own example, as simple examples as possible, where they have demonstrated some of demonstrated some of those values, and how did they do that? What were the behaviors that they went into? And that was uh, that was a great opening up uh, process that we got into as an organization. And people would forth would be forthcoming with their examples of how exactly uh, they demonstrated uh, a value called, for example courage. So how did they demonstrate courage? They went on to talk about specific actions. Now what we did, we created stories out of that because that's important. We don't want one person to live a value that the organization wants. We want everybody to live those values. And uh, uh, here is a person who has been able to show and demonstrate how to live that particular value. So we captured those stories and communicated that wide and spread across the organization. Uh, including sometimes to our suppliers and to some of our customers. And we demonstrated how you could live uh, such examples. And then there was, um, uh, it was like a jungle fire. You know, everybody would come up with their own examples of courage, performance, solidarity, and things like that, and other uh, relevant values. They would talk about how did they live those values. And over a period of time, once everybody started talking about it, you know what happens? Uh, the great thing is when you make people talk about how they acted and behaved in a particular uh, situation to demonstrate a particular value, you win their commitment to that particular value uh, in the in, you know in life because they know they can live that value and they have told that they have lived this value, so they are going to give full commitment to it. So that's, that's the insight and learning that we gain out of this exercise. Uh, and, and finally, make sure that everybody does uh, something of that sort in some way or the other, uh, in terms of demonstrating those actions that align with the, with the specific values. Now, there's, uh, there's another element uh, through which we can ensure that uh, values are built and sustained in people. And the other element is coaching. So as part of my uh, uh, professional work, um, I do business coaching, but I also get involved in something called behavioral event interview. Many of you would know about this. In, in behavioral event interview, which I do with uh, the, the leadership teams uh, in organizations, including the CXOs, um, we would try and understand how did they operate in a particular uh, situation when they were faced with a particular uh, particular uh, challenge. And in doing so, they will have to narrate the story. They don't have to talk about uh, a step-by-step -step process, but they have to narrate their story. And while, while they talk about the story, uh, I would pick up those behaviors, actually, because those behaviors are important, right? And see whether they have been aligning their behaviors with a specific competencies of the organization, uh, right? Because the organization uh, would like those behaviors to be mapped with the competencies uh, and the competency behaviors in the organization. So we would do that. Uh, another thing that we did was around the ethical dimensions. 
Now, ethical dimensions um, are also situations where you are in a paradox. You do not know what to do. Uh, you, you don't think uh, that three options which are available to you, uh, any of them is better than others. And which is where uh, we get caught in, in a complete dilemma and operating in that dilemma becomes really difficult. And which is where the deeper sense of values that people have and deeper sense of, um, sense of action and mindset that people would have would emerge eventually in, in finally choosing one action over the other actions. So this is, uh, this is what uh, I have been doing as part of my coaching exercise. And it has been helping people to basically uh, understand that they are stuck in a dilemma. A lot of time people don't even realize that they are in a situation uh, uh, which, it, which could be called as ethical dilemma. Uh, the other aspect is that once uh, they are aware of the, the dimension, ethical dimension that they are in, into, or a problem, not, not really the problem, but the, the situation that demands them to work uh, and act more uh, from the perspective of their values, then, uh, then considering this situation just like a day-to-day -day life situation, uh, is when these people are going to be more conscious of their personal values and the organizational values. But uh, the real uh, thing is that when you are coaching, you don't have to give answers, right? That's the fundamental thing. You have to encourage people to find answers for themselves. Uh, and again, questioning and putting across queries becomes really important, and which is where I would do the same thing with the audience, and you could do the same thing with, with your students. When they are stuck in a problem, ask them questions rather than giving them answers. And finally, if they have been able to get out of uh, a challenging situation, uh, help them uh, re define their own framework rather than going into uh, the, the theoretical frameworks, because all of us can come up with, their, with our own framework. And I remember the words of Donna Letkin, who said that the first, the first uh, um, uh, uh, tool to recognize that you are in a dilemma or you are in a situation where you need to evolve in your action is your mind, your body, and your heart. These three things will immediately tell you that you are in a situation where you have to invoke uh, your value system, right? So that's about coaching. Uh, uh, I was reading another paper um, and where I realized that this is something which is very important from the systems thinking perspective. And I was attending just before this session, I was attending uh, another session uh, from one of the politicians in India and where we talked about the education system. And, and, and I think um, in terms of system thinking, it, the organizations, when they are operating, they are not just operating for their employees or their customers or for their shareholders. There is a larger set of people, institutions and organization and society at large which gets impacted by the actions. And those stakeholders also impact these organizations in return. So how do we operate uh, in, in a larger environment becomes important to know. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, what I think is, and this is one example that, that I talked about uh, Jan, in January uh, 2018 during my uh, panel discussion in Delhi, Performance as a value, if performance is a value in the organization, how do we basically help people perform? Uh, and and, uh, and the mere issue around it is that you have to first clarify the outcomes that you want to have from people. A lot of time we do not tell people what they're supposed to do. It's a simple process you have to clarify. That is one. Second thing is remove hurdles. Uh, from all sorts of behaviors that are important to achieve that particular outcome. If we as an organization do not create a system uh, or uh, the, the, the mechanism in the organization, which is basically helping remove those hurdles, then we are only creating a challenging environment, a non-conducive environment for the person to perform. And finally, and this is the job of the managers, immediate managers, they need to uh, utilize feedback as a tool to inform the employees and, and people around them and even peers maybe uh, to help them guide their actions better in future. Um, a lot of time when we are acting in a situation, we do not know how we are acting. Someone from outside would be in a better position to inform me, how did I act? Uh, 
whether there were certain more options that I was blind to, someone who is who is away and disconnected from the situation would be in a better position to tell me. And I think uh, the organizations need to uh, encourage a healthy feedback mechanism in the organization. Uh, and, and, and people need to uh, also be willing to accept the feedback from others, be it critical feedback or not. Uh, I'm towards the end of my presentation and then we will move to the Q&A. Uh, this is this is something this is something which is very important uh, as i have learned um, which is role modeling uh, and if you look at uh, entrepreneurship as one of the values for for a company for an organization uh, what would be the associated behavior the associated behavior is risk taking right the ability to to take risk if i am saying my organization's value is entrepreneurship and if i'm not as a leader encouraging my people to take risks, then I'm not living that particular value of entrepreneurship. And I'm not letting entrepreneurship as a value thrive in my organization. Then it is a beautiful word hanging on the walls of the corporate. So, so which is where the leaders will have to come forward and demonstrate uh, sometimes even vulnerability and even risk taking uh, in, the, in the organization and even be absolutely fine with errors and mistakes that happen. Let people fail. And I was reading this book by, by Richard Taylor, uh, uh, Misbehaving. And here he, he mentioned something which is very important that when it comes to projects, when they are chosen, when the projects are chosen, the decision criteria are different. But when they fail, the criteria get different. The situation gets different. The context is completely away from the criteria when uh, the project was started and the decision makers, especially the manager who picked this project up was guided by the criteria and that particular context. And everybody clapped at that point in time. When the project failed, everybody started blaming, including the boss started blaming uh, the manager because they were now measuring the decision making of this individual manager, not based on that particular criteria when they started, but on today's situation, which I think is extremely wrong. So, so this is where I think uh, the leaders have the opportunity to demonstrate those specific behaviors which are connected with the particular values they want their people to live. And finally, I talked about Richard Taylor, uh, and I wouldn't go away without uh, carrying a slide on his name. So, Nudge, um, so what Nudge does, uh, so far we have been talking about values in forming our actions. I think here is something which, is, uh, which, which I call a journey back to values. If you nudge people at large through policy making, you could actually create a specific value. And Richard talks about a particular country in Europe, which is, not, which is very high in donating their organs after, after they pass away. However, the same ratio or the same percentage does not apply to a number of other European countries. And when they went into its analysis, they realized that uh, on, uh, the, on, on a particular form, uh, which they fill during insurance and other processes, uh, there is a particular option that people will have to opt out of it, which clearly says that I am donating my organs once I pass away to others. Now that's, that's mandatory. If I want to opt, opt out of it, I have to choose. Now it is a simple action and people do not want to do one extra action. And in that process, that particular country in Europe has been able to have about 90% of people committing their organs to others once they pass away, while the ratio with others is extremely low. So similarly, I mean, this is one example. We can pick up other examples where we can define particular actions that go on to build a particular value in that culture uh, at, at the university level or at the college level. And that's, that's what I think Richard Taylor's theory of nudge is extremely important to know and understand. And finally, the concluding remarks. Uh, I'm not going to repeat things. Uh, these are four important elements. I think. Uh, bringing clarity is extremely important, very important, uh, because a lot of time people do not know the meaning of values. They believe that th these are universal values, nice terms, uh, I need to know them. We are not there to explain them the, uh, 
uh, dictionary meaning of values, but I think the job is to identify critical behaviors and helping people understand what those behaviors are, which eventually go on to uh, uh, summarize as a value once we display them. The next is diversity, and, and I think this is extremely important because uh, if we encourage people to accept different views, uh, they would be in a better position to remove a lot of their ignorance of the of the context that they have never been to right and it is a luxury i would say if i'm into a diverse culture it is a luxury for me because i'm now able to live the contexts and experiences of so many people that i can't afford to live myself firsthand so that's that's something which is important and and i'm sure you people would be knowing the organization called ibm which has reaped so many benefits out of the diversity uh, philosophy that they run through uh, throughout their organization and finally values the term values and, and and the values that we have such as integrity or trust they are universal terms they apply to all of us but defining their behaviors brings uniqueness to them to your context so for example uh, honesty or integrity in the context of a healthcare uh, organization would be different would be unique when it comes to the, the specific behaviors, but it will be slightly different when it comes to a law firm. So law firm demonstrating certain integrity, it would have certain uh, behaviors that they need to demonstrate to live that uh, universal value of integrity. And finally, uh, I think uh, we have to be patient with building the values. Uh, it takes a great amount of time because we are trying to change the deep seated uh, behaviors, mindset of people, it takes time and we will have to be patient with it, allow time for people to absorb and then uh, think about it, reflect on various things and then uh, be able to respond to, 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 to those situations and to those values. Uh, so in my opinion, being patient is something that will pay off immensely. Uh, and, and you have no other option, uh, to be very honest. If we want to uh, drill the values down into the minds of our people, it wouldn't simply work, believe me. So, Jen, that's the end of my, my PPT. Happy to take the questions now. Perfect. Um, you know, I really love this because I'm all about behavior. <laughs> I'm all about behavior. <laughs> so I was, I was taking a lot of notes. I'm definitely going to be looking up the two books that you just referenced. Um, the thing that really struck me at the end was on the concept of diversity. And part of that is because I'm working on my own thinking through that uh, to create some uh, uh, programs on it. And I really like the idea of, you know, the, the values being universal, but how those values are expressed in behavior are going to be different, uh, not just culturally, but from each individual based on their situation and helping people look for the value that's being expressed, not assuming that there is no value, which is how normal a lot of people approach people who behave differently, or but that they look for the common universal value that's driving that behavior, because there's almost always a common yes. universal value behind it, right? Um, so I really, that, that framework for thinking about how to explain how to people how to be how to find cohesion in the diversity like that's always yeah. the challenge is how do you find cohesion with diversity and i think this is an excellent framework for that if you can stop sharing the screen um that'll allow me to look at the chat room <laughs> and start pulling up some of the questions yes i will it's up at the very top there you go um okay so let's get to some of the questions um so uh, Bruce Kibler says, it's in, in essence, it seems as if you are presenting a form of change management. However, there seems to be an idealistic assumption that resistance will merely disappear by itself, either by attrition or by self-reflecting enlightenment. Or how does one deal with the resistance if that's not the case? So if I've uh, understood the question correctly, uh, Bruce is asking about that um, if you are getting into, so my presentation more looks like a change management from the perspective of change management rather than the value. 
And if um, there is resistance, how to deal with the resistance, even if it is change management. Have I understood it correctly? Yeah. You are on mute. Sorry. I believe that's the question. How, how do we, the assumption was that there's an ideal. Yes. He says yes. Good. Bruce okay. Says yes. Perfect. So thanks, Bruce, for the question. Um, Bruce, uh, you might say so, uh, and I would allow you to have that sort of uh, perspective about, about the presentation. But I think what I've tried to do is um, two things. One is bringing my own experience and bringing the work of three people. And two I have mentioned here, and one I could not because I've not made any points about uh, that, lay, that, that writer. So in the first case, uh, in, in the second case of, of um, talking about the work of um, uh, scholars, it is absolutely about values. But yes, you are absolutely right. It could uh, have the threats of change management when I talk about my own experiential learning here in the form of helping people adopt to new ways of uh, value system. And I tell you, um, one of the things that I faced, uh, now I'm moving on to the resistance bit, is that people, all of us, uh, are going to have our own individual values, right? And the moment I, ven I venture into a particular organization, here is a company that has certain set of values that may be different from mine, right? Uh, and how do I build that sort of overlap uh, is the challenge for organizations. Uh, and, and, I, and I think the resistance is going to come. Uh, it's not that resistance will evade, which is where, uh, in my opinion, allowing people to talk about their values, helping people to come out with their views, and then letting those views uh, not be shot down. We, we cannot do that actually. And helping them why these behaviors that you demonstrate would help uh, in, 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 in achieving the organization's objective and eventually the objectives for you as an individual because you're part of my organization uh, and this is win-win for all. We understand that you're bringing your own set of values. We respect that and here are our values. So when you are in a professional world and when you are on work, you will have to demonstrate this. How you could do that, there's going to be a journey where there is no overlap and we will work together to do that. That also means uh, that uh, the organizations have a job at hand while finally selecting the team members. Not just looking at the skill set, but also looking at the chemistry. How do they eventually gel with you, uh, you, with you as an organization and the culture of the organization? So for example, some people might be very aggressive, right? Um, and I can take the example of Pepsi and KFC, for example, right? When both the organizations merged, eventually they had to say goodbye to each other because the culture in KFC was more of uh, servicing customers, where the Pepsi's culture is more of selling the bottles, right? Pushing the bottles down the throat. So that's the possible approach. So if, if those values crash and clash with each other, you are going to see the divorce happening. So we have got the job at hand to ensure that there is a good amount of overlap. If it doesn't happen, then how do we basically are um, amicably bringing those people onto, onto, our, onto the organization board uh, of values? Yeah, it, um, I really like this topic. It was, it's interesting because I don't know how you can get those mergers to occur without the conversation of values. I was involved in a tower company and we purchased all of Motorola's towers in the United States, which was humongous. And with that purchase came their employees. And we had to have conversations about what a good tower was. And because what a good tower was to Motorola was not what a good tower was to us at a tower company. Motorola wanted towers in specific locations and we wanted towers that could generate revenue. And it, we, until we had those conversations around values, we, we were having a really hard time working together. And I think the other thought I had was that, you know, in the work that I do, I think the hardest part is giving permission to people to have these conversations about the values so that they can work it out. Absolutely. True. 
All right, so let's go on to the next question. This is from Imran. Any corporate strategy statement is based on its mission, vision, and values. In recent times, we have witnessed some of the world's best known companies going against their own values that are written and having layoffs and racial discrimination occur. Do you believe that these written values and code of ethics for those corporates should be rewritten or are they right in using a deontological and utilitarian approach appropriately? Right. So Imran, I think thanks for your question. Uh, and before I answer, I tell you, I think when I work with the, um, uh, the, the business clients, I talk about three things that you're talking and then I will introduce one more element to it. Here is a vision that any organization would like to achieve and vision, vision is particularly, uh, it's, it's not a goal in itself. You want to aspire to achieve it. It is something that never gets achieved actually. So you, you want to achieve this. You want to move into that direction. It is more of a direction. So that is vision. And if you have a vision and then you have a mission, then there are two components to it further down the line. One is what to achieve, right? And the other is how to achieve the, the vision piece. And when it comes to what to achieve, we talk about a number of goals that organizations have for their employees, right? But how to achieve is something that informs every person in the organization that what should be your behavior? What should be your values that are going to guide your goal achievement? You can't just go out and do whatever to achieve those goals. So we have given you goals, but you have to go out and achieve these specific goals in this manner only. And which is where you might say that values in a way are also going to create some sort of boundaries for you. Right? They, they, they are going to give you freedom when you are in dark because they are going to inform you how you can move from here, but they also some, sometimes give you boundaries that you cannot cross as individuals, right? So I think that's how uh, it should be approached. Now, coming to your question of uh, should the organizations um, rewrite their, their, their values, I think um, it would be too early to comment on that. And, and if values can't help you in uncertain and difficult times, then I think those are not sustainable values in themselves. Values are there to define you in the darkest of the times, right? You need to be driven by that. And I can invoke one example here from one of my clients. When in extremely difficult situation, they had one option, of course, which is clear to all the organizations today world over, is to ask people to leave. Uh, and, and I tell you, being from human resources function, I know how those dialogues happen, right? There are experts who would tell you how to have that dialogue, right? And here was the founder who said, my value, one of my uh, values in the organization is dignity. Even if I have to do that, I will somehow have to manage dignity. I can't do the way the expert is telling me to do. I can't do that because the expert is guided by the legal framework. I'm not guided by that because I think my value system is bigger than the legal framework. And that guy went on to talk to their employees one on one and said, I think we will have to put you on furlough. I know it's difficult for you for us as well, but whenever we go to hire anyone, it will be just you. The, the first will be you and then we will move out uh, to, to hire anybody else. It was difficult. It was not easy. Uh, it, it must have given headaches to this guy, but he lived that, that particular value. To date, it's been about two months now. I think he's very satisfied and now things have changed and the talent that had left is now slowly and gradually, some of them are joining back. I think values are there to guide us in darkest of times, not in good times. Good times, we are all fine. So I would not like to go ahead and change the values um, of, of the corporates. That would be my view. I agree wholeheartedly. You know, when I find myself in difficult situations, the, the thing that helps me find the way out is reminding myself, okay, what are my values and what is my ideal? I might not be able to make that, but it at least points me to the direction I should be pointing in. <laughs> And yes. the direction to go. So, and your story was perfect for that. 
Um, Ron Nasser says, business roundtable five commitments is an example of words on the wall, but a step in awareness and language. I'm not sure what the question is, but if I had to expand on that with the question, I would say, um, is, is having words on the wall a, a step in the way towards creating awareness and language and behavior around values within an organization? Uh, so, um, uh, thanks, Jen. But I think there's one question from no Ron Nasser. If you want, I can pick that up. Yeah, because I think uh, he has a question. So okay. let's answer. Maybe. Good. He says, a major force in bringing back virtue ethics in the West uh, is, yes, you're right, as there, uh, new Aristotelian. Uh, and then he talks about the question here is this question. Uh, what are the sources in India and China? Is it Confucius, Hindu, Hindu ethics? Um, so, Nasser, I think uh, China is one country which is not that diverse. But if you if you come to India, and I'm sure you would have known India, uh, India is um, you know in itself multiple countries in a way. Uh, you move 50 kilometers in any direction, and you would see a completely different dialect completely different culture and India is living uh, is a living example of extremely high diversity right and and there and if you look at Hindu ethics uh, there are thousands of Hindu gods right and each god is guiding people in a certain manner so there is a god of money there is a god of dance music and whatnot and each god would of course want their way right so, so I think people sometimes might be feeling, okay, let me, let me just put everything there. Let me think about it myself. And uh, which is what is happening. China may be Confucius, yes. Uh, but, but I think in India, uh, this, this, the sort of source that we are having is uh, driven from some of the uh, leaders, for example, Gandhi, right? So, uh, so people get uh, um, uh, the opportunity to invoke Gandhi all the time. Uh, about ahimsa, about non-violence. So it's been more than 70 years, we still talk about it. So even jokingly, we would say, let's not fight, let's live the Gandhi way, ahimsa, or non-violence. Even in uh, you know jokes, we would say that. So that's culturally very much into our DNA. And I think we, we, we are more prone to invoke some of the uh, political leaders or the social leaders uh, for example, Lala Lajpat Rai, we will invoke them. All the warriors uh, is what we will invoke instead of uh, the religion uh, in India, I would say. That's my opinion, I, uh, I think, but that's what I realize uh, is the case here in India. Um, so Violetta says, standard instruments are applicable to different cultures and continents for research. Education has a big responsibility for developing the values we are born with, um, and we learn them constantly. So curriculum is to be explicable more than integrative. Thoughts? I, I think yes. Um, this is very uh, a very good point, uh, Viola. Violeta, right? Uh, and I think. Um, so I, the other day I was reading um, a piece on mental models, moral imagination, and also the system thinking, one of which I picked up here for the purpose of our discussion. I think uh, moral imagination is something that we have to really work on as educators. All of us are going to have our own mental uh, models, our own mindset, informed by our own context. But I think as educators, our responsibility is to help our students uh, get into an imaginative journey where we are helping them uh, do the moral imagination where they can think about the other alternative mental models which they have not been exposed to. The example that I picked uh, about the diversity, it is about diversity. So I may not have been exposed to it, but if the teacher is able to bring that uh, uh, mental model or a new context to the student and let them play with it for some time, and say, why don't you question it? Why don't you say, I disagree or I agree with it? And let them question 
uh, the teacher about that particular uh, um, you know mental model if that happens i think one thing that we are clearly doing slowly and gradually is opening people to the fact that there is no single mindset that belongs to me there are thousands hundreds and millions of mindsets that are out there and as an individual i would be really good if i am able to at least listen to others and that's the beginning of the journey that you want your student to embark on where they are willing to accept and even change uh, the the mental model that they are operating with i i recall the example of that i read somewhere example of walmart so walmart is a great organization we all know they operate with the mental model called uh, cheap price always low price always right and the moment and this is the strategy of the company and the moment this is the strategy rest of the things here on are going to be informed by this punch line right if they have to live this and if they do so what they are going to do is they are going to generate more profits for their shareholders because they are going to sell more to their customers because they are finding cheap products good products at affordable prices and therefore uh, the shareholders will have their value creation at the same time uh, because there is larger sales happening there would be more number of people employed they will have improved salaries over a period of time etc etc but nobody is thinking about the worker who is producing a product in a manufacturing setup in vietnam or in bangladesh for walmart under extremely inhuman conditions now that's the mental uh, map that we have to have when we are talking about walmart so till the time we don't touch that walmart looks an awesome company and it is an awesome company no doubt about it but the moment walmart uh, leadership thinks about walmart from the perspective of this individual worker then the game entirely changes so what can walmart do about it same was the case when one of the um, outsourcing factories in in china uh, started having suicides and there the 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 apple phones were manufactured now apple could have definitely said i don't know i don't employ those people who am i to be blamed for this but the american citizens did not agree with it the customers didn't agree with it they said the the the, the phone that i have the laptop that i have has been manufactured in a factory where there are instances of suicide and you apple hold influence and being an influential stakeholder in the entire game it is your responsibility to fix problems and there you go so i think um, that would be my perspective um, uh, on 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 the question that uh, you raised excellent i was wondering um, on the first part of that when you're in a classroom with students do you get resistance to playing with morality you know the, the concept of introducing the concepts and then letting them play with it do you find that they struggle to do that at first or you know how do you get them comfortable with doing that so uh, jen um for me uh, the broad uh, sets of audience that i have they are broadly two one the corporate executives and the other is the budding entrepreneurs who want to build their ventures so broadly for me those are the audience so i tell you and we face uh, those uh, moral dilemmas and one of the things for example the entrepreneurs face is should i copy the other idea right should i just copy paste uh, or should i create my own and i tell you um uh, what should be the advice to people and the moment you say no you shouldn't copy it is not right then they would invoke the example of some of the largest organizations in country one of the largest in the country who has uh, shamefully copied zoom right it is a replica of zoom and because they have a lot of money they could create a parallel of zoom like this at least to operate in india and we realize that uh, the entrepreneurs are talking about that as an example and saying why can't i do this right and then you cannot really talk about just the ethics you have to reason with them and you have to tell them that if you do this you cannot basically be a winner in the long run why because you at least do not have one of the most important things that this large house has is money and capital 
You don't have that. You do not have the brand. So if you do this, you would be nowhere. And which is where they understand. So resistance comes, or we are in a position to reason it with them. And they are in a position to understand the larger perspective about it. The other aspect about the copying bit is um, that, and, and this, again, I'm talking about uh, a celebrity Harvard Business School professor of public policy who says that uh, when it comes to building ventures, please do not just chase innovation, right? You could be a great successful entrepreneur even without uh, having an innovation and just copying something which already exists, but, and there's a big but, you have to see it from the customer's perspective that you are creating value. If you are creating value that is sufficient enough to, for you to go ahead and copy an existing model elsewhere, because the moment you are into a creation uh, of value game, you are basically innovative in itself automatically. That is something what is happening. The other that, that happens with the corporate executive. And I think um, there was one example when I was uh, evaluating a, a senior candidate uh, from Middle East for one of my clients uh, for a role. He talked about uh, uh, how he, he smartly got a very difficult situation under control and got the project okayed by bribing someone. He thought it is going to be actually uh, helping uh, the cause of his candidature, but it didn't. Because I said, uh, I of course didn't tell him, but in my report I mentioned, this is a clear violation of the values that your organization lives with. If you are fine with this candidate, I found him absolutely fine on other competencies, but here I found him lacking completely and I would give one, zero actually to him as a candidate, but I leave it to you on other competencies. He was perfectly fine touching four or five out of five uh, scale and they did not hire him. That tells a lot about the organization's strength with respect to their values. Uh, we're almost done. I have one last question uh, for from David Bauman. He says, do you have any exercises that you use in companies to translate values into behaviors? Yeah, so I briefly talked about the example of uh, helping uh, uh, people uh, coming up with their own values that they have demonstrated in the pharma company that I was touching upon. So I'll give you what we did. We ran something called culture workshops. We, we titled them culture workshops. And we said, uh, we are going to uh, help build the culture of our organization bottom up rather than top down. That was our approach. But what we did, and there I had to really have a buy-in from the senior leadership because the leadership would say, how come the culture could be created bottom up and could be something that we do not want? And there I had to tell them, that whatever culture we are going to build bottom up, that will rest on values as the pillars. So the moment you say the values are going to be the pillars and the informing and guiding principle, then if we have done the job right, I think we will create uh, absolutely uh, right sort of um, culture that we as an organization want. And what we did, we we basically ask, asked people to, uh, understand and tell us what exactly uh, they know or they understand about a specific value. So for example, we said performance. If performance is a value, what do you mean by this value as such? So uh, it is a universal term, could be applied anywhere, but in its uniqueness, it has got its specific uh, behaviors that I will have to demonstrate as a medical representative of this pharma company, right? So I picked those up. And we created a stories out of that. And that was the exercise that we did. And there we went ahead and communicated. It took us uh, about six months time to do this exercise. And when, when I say six months, it was the beginning of letting people know what the value means in, in the context of this organization. What are the specific behaviors that I have to demonstrate to live a particular value? And what are the examples that I can see and understand that my colleagues have demonstrated. And, and, and that is how we encouraged people to do this. That's the tool exercise that we do uh, with a number of other um, people. And, and the behavioral event interview that I talked about, uh, most of you would be knowing about it. Uh, it basically 
asks people how did they behave in a particular manner. So one is uh, that the BEI as a tool could be used for selection purpose, but it could very well be uh, utilized for development purpose in this particular case. And where we uh, talk, we create questions around the value that we want to build in people and ask how would you have lived a particular event like this? And they would talk about their history and share. And once they share, we can pick those positive examples or behaviors and reiterate them, encourage them to live those behaviors more often. And if there are uh, contrasting behaviors or negative behaviors, we pick them up also and say, these are the ones that might be putting you into challenge in, in living those values. So if you may want to avoid that, would be great. That's how I think we could go ahead. Excellent, excellent. So um, 